In this, the Bible, there are 66 books, 1,189 verses or chapters, 31,102 verses, 66 books written by 40 authors over a span of approximately 15 to 1,600 years, which is a long time. If you go back 1,500 years from now, well, the, the empires of Europe haven't even been founded yet. 66 books with perfect harmony and unity because although written by 40 different men, that God would use to pen his words. It's not their words, for the Bible declares that every word in the word of God was God-breathed. That is, inspired by God. God moved the hands of these men to write the words of God so that men who had no knowledge of each other that lived in completely different times throughout history would write in complete unity And the Bible, well, it covers from the beginning of time, then throughout history, to the present time that we are now living in, into the future times through prophecy. For one third of this book deals with future events. And then into the end of time, then into all eternity where there is no longer time. But everything in this book all points to one person and three events. And if you don't understand this, then the Bible will be hard for you to understand. The one person, of course, is Jesus Christ. The three events are Jesus' first coming to deal with sin, Jesus' death and resurrection to conquer sin, and then Jesus' second coming for those who will be free from the presence of sin. And everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. For there is a picture in the Old Testament for every New Testament principle. Now, you might think you got gypped when you open up your Bible when I tell you this, but the Bible is the biggest picture book in the world. And as you thumb through it, you might say, well, I got gypped because there's no pictures in my Bible. But the pictures that I'm talking about are illustrations And every single Old Testament story is a picture of a New Testament doctrine or principle that Jesus would teach or that would be practiced throughout the early church. And so everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Then you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's different accounts from their eyewitness perspective to the life of Jesus. Now, you might think when you read the Bible for the first time and you get through Matthew and then you get into Mark, you're like, man, I feel like I just read this. This is a little bit of a deja vu, but God had it to be that way so that you wouldn't miss it. Just in case when you're reading through the Bible, God would say, okay, just so you know, this is the main event of the story of the plan of redemption, that I'm going to give it to you four times so that you don't miss it. But then after the Gospels, everything in the New Testament points back to Jesus, So the Old Testament points to Jesus. The Gospels, the story of Jesus. Then the New Testament, everything pointing back to Jesus. And now to understand where we are going, you need to understand where we have come from. And so we're going to take it back all the way back to the beginnings, the beginning of the world. For the word Genesis actually means the beginnings. And so there is a biblical principle called the principle of first mention. Because in the Bible, which is an incredibly interesting book that God has given to humanity. But in the Bible, the the principle of first mention is this. Wherever something is first mentioned in the Bible, it gives a key understanding to understand that principle or that doctrine throughout the rest of the Bible. And the book of Genesis, well, well, it's filled with the firsts. 
being the first book of the Bible, Genesis deals with the beginnings of everything, the beginning of the universe and the world, the beginning of mankind, the beginning of marriage, the beginning of sin, the beginning of the family, the beginning of God's plan for salvation. And so Genesis deals with the beginnings of everything that was created. And so in studying this book, we are going to be able to get a far greater understanding of everything given in the Bible by understanding the first mentions of these firsts that take place in the book of Genesis. And in chapter 1, we deal with the creation of the world. And you might be thinking, well, what does the creation of the world have to do with my life presently? What does this have to do with me? Well, I promise that you are going to see an interesting illustration in creation of God's plan for redemption from even the way that God created the world. So let's take a look. We're in Genesis chapter 1. If you don't know where that's at, just take the Bible of the person sitting next to you. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now this is the first mention of God. The Old Testament, apart from two different books in the Old Testament, was written in the language of Hebrew, the Hebrew language. And the word that's used in Hebrew in the original language that the Bible was recorded in for the word God is Elohim. Now it's interesting, as you study the Hebrew language, the word El, E-L, is singular. The word Ella, E-L-A, is dual. But the word Elohim means three or more. And from the very first mention of God, the Bible identifies God not as a singular entity, but is a reference to the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so it says, in the beginning, before time was even there. Now that's hard for us to understand because we have finite minds. We live inside of time and space. And because we live within time and space, it's nearly impossible for us to try to understand what happens outside of time and space. But God is not limited to what we are limited to. God is not limited to time. And that's why in the Bible, when God gives promises in his word of something that's going to take place in your future. Do you know every time God gives a promise in the Bible about the future events or things that will take place in your future? God talks about it in the past tense. How can God talk about your future in the past tense? Because when God speaks about something, he, outside of time and space, sees that it's already been done because he's not limited to the time-space continuum like we are. And so God has always existed. People will try to stump you and say, well, who made God or where did God come from? Well, you're not gonna be able to figure it out because, well, you're a finite being and God is infinite. But God has always been. In the beginning, God was. And then eventually time will come to an end and we will go to eternity whether it's an eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell, based upon our decision in this life, whether we reject or accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But in the time in which we are in, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Now it's interesting when it comes to the heavens. The vast Milky Way galaxy that our planet, planet Earth, is within has over 200 billion stars. To travel across just our own galaxy, the Milky Way, you would have to travel at the speed of light, which is close to 300 million miles per second. But if you could travel at 300 million miles per second, don't worry, it would only take you 200,000 years to travel across the Milky Way galaxy. We are talking a vast, massive galaxy that our planet, planet Earth, is within. But do you know, that's only one little galaxy in the heavens. Astronomers estimate that there's actually probably around 100 to 200 billion galaxies in the universe. And because of the vastness of the universe, 
scientists and astronomers believe that it is impossible to measure how big our universe actually is. But there's another variable, not just the vastness of our universe, but the other variable that makes it difficult to measure is that the universe is constantly expanding. Not only is the universe expanding, but each galaxy that would take you 200,000 years to travel across at 300 million miles per second, that those vast galaxies are traveling away from each other at different speeds. And the estimated speed of the expansion rate is believed to be 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. You're like, well, what does that mean? It just means it's really, really fast. In such a speed, so fast, at such great distances that the astronomers and scientists say it's impossible to measure the vastness of the heavens. But it's interesting what modern day scientists and astronomers are now just finding out. That one of the oldest books, Genesis and Job, the two oldest books in the Bible, in the book of Job, in chapter 9, verse 8, it says that he, God, alone, stretches out the heavens. The oldest book in the Bible before any modern science says that God is ex actually expanding the universe and the heavens, that he stretched out the heavens. The Bible actually states that God is stretching out the heavens 17 different times throughout the Bible. In, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12, it says that God measures the heavens with the span of his hand. Now, the span is the distance between the pinky and the thumb. And this vast, immeasurable universe that we live in, God literally can measure it with the span of his hand to give you some comparison to how great, how powerful, how huge God is. And God created everything that we have in the entire universe in six days. Jesus said 2,000 years ago in John chapter 14, verse 2 through 3, I go to prepare a place for you. In Jesus' first coming, Jesus told the disciples, that I'm going to go and prepare a place for, for you, and then I will return. Jesus has been spending the last 2,000 years preparing heaven for us. If God could create such a vast universe in just six days, imagine what God is creating over the last 2,000 years. It's going to be amazing, and we'll have all eternity to explore it. But when God began to create the heavens of the earth, it goes on to say in verse 2, The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surfaces of the water. So we now see day one, which is separating light from darkness. It goes on to say in verse three, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Day number one, God takes this void, and in this void creates, in creating our planet, separates light from darkness, marking day one. Then in verse six, God said, let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of heavens. And God called the space sky. And evening passed and morning came, marking the second day. Day number two, God created the firmament. Now when the world was created and born into existence, it says that God separated the waters of the earth from the waters of heaven. And between the waters of the heavens and the waters of earth, in between that was sky. But notice it says the water of heavens. Because when God created the world, there was a water canopy around the world. The world, and then the sky, and then in the heavens, the water above. 
Now, keep in mind, there's three heavens in the Bible. The first heaven, what's called the first heaven, is the atmosphere. It's where the birds fly, or what we would call sky. It's where we take a plane and go because, well, we have to travel, and so we go into the sky where the birds fly. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is everything beyond the atmosphere, uh, above the sky. It's the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the thermosphere, the exosphere, all the other spheres. That's the second heaven. And then in the Bible, there's the third heaven. The third heaven is what we think of when we hear the word heaven. That's the place that we want to go to and spend all eternity with God, going to heaven. So in the three heavens, the, the heaven that's being talked about here is the first heaven. And this was a water canopy surrounding the world. It's the water canopy that God allowed to collapse on planet Earth during the flood of Noah that caused the cataclysmic and catastrophic events of the world. But while this water canopy was in place, it would cause so many different events to take place in the world. It would cause an oxygen-rich environment. That's why when you see fossils of huge, massive creatures like dinosaurs, the rib cages of many of these creatures were so tiny compared to the rest of their bodies, which would mean their, their heart would be too small to pump blood through the rest of their body. Their lungs would be too small to pump oxygen through their body. It, it, they would have died immediately if it wasn't for the oxygen-rich environment in which they would live in. But while this water canopy would be in fact, it would pump enough oxygen and blood with this oxygen-rich environment. There would also be uniform environments around the planet and lush vegetation across the world, which explains why even today, scientists are still discovering vegetation found frozen in Antarctica. And what they're finding is this vegetation is found 100 times the normal size. Fern leaves that span 150 feet per leaf. And they're finding these things frozen within the ice caps. And secular scientists and explorers believe at one time, Antarctica was a lush forest. And there would also, in this water canopy, oxygen-rich environment, there would be a decrease in ultraviolet rays that would be caused by the sun, which causes much of our aging. It would be one gigantic SP1 million surrounding the world. And that's why before the flood, that men, mankind, would often live several hundred years of age. And even some recorded to be over 900 years old, like Noah and Methuselah. And so day two, God created this firmament, this beautiful firmament that would protect the world and allow the world to prosper in a healthy way. Then in verse 9, it goes on to say, God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place so dry ground may appear. And that is what happened. God called the dry ground land and the waters seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation. Every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit these seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the third day. Now day three, God created the earth, the sea, and vegetation. And notice this, it says that God separated the ocean from the land. And I'm going to say this again, God separates the ocean from the land. And I only say that because right now within our country, and it's become a political movement that right now that there's a movement within our country that's obsessed with and consumed by what's called global warming where the ice caps in Antarctica are melting, and, and if the water levels raise, well then, the west and east coast of our country is going to be flooded, and states are going to be missing. 
And by no means am I advocating that we should not take care of the planet that God has entrusted to us and not trash it. But as a Christian, we don't have to be consumed with or bothered by what's called global warming or melting snow caps because it's not something that we have to panic about or even give a second thought to. Why? Because Proverbs chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, talking about the creation of the world, this very story that we're reading says that he, God, made firm the skies above, he established the fountains of the deep. And in verse 29, it says this, he assigned to the sea its limits so that the water might not transgress God's command. He marked out the foundations of the earth. So God marked out a boundary. This is going to be earth. This is gonna be land. And this is going to be sea. And the sea cannot transgress God's command. So you don't have to worry about, well, are we going to be flooded? You know, in California, that was more of a worry for Californians because, well, the state would be gone. You know, here in Idaho, you know, if global warming was actually real and that actually happened and our country was flooded, that just means California, Oregon, and Washington would disappear, you know. (laughs) Not such a bad thing. And then we in Idaho would have oceanfront property in the best of both worlds. So (laughs) praise Jesus. But God created the land, the sea, and vegetation. God marked out its boundaries, and nothing can transgress or disobey God's command. So that's day three. Then day four, going on in verse 14. It says, then God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that is what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. And God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the fourth day. Day four, God created the sun, moon, and stars. And God makes lights in the sky to rule or govern, some translations put it, the day and the night. The sun, of course, is the greater light. The moon is the lesser light, which reflects the greater light. Note this, though. The sun was created on day four, vegetation on day three. You might say, well, why is that important? Well, there's some that try to combine God's word with secular ideology, meaning we're going to take what the Bible says, but try to mix it with what secular society says, especially when it comes to the topic of how this world came to be and the process of evolution, So they'll say, well, doesn't the Bible say that to God a day is as a thousand years and as a thousand years is as a day? So maybe this day isn't a literal one day, but just a figurative day, which could be any length of period of time. Could be a thousand years, could be a million years. So God, you know, put things in motion, but then God used evolution to bring everything into existence. Can I just say that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life? And the reason why is, well, when God says it took him a day, it took him a day. Stop trying to take your beliefs, which are unbiblical, and find a way to work them into the Bible. Plus, well, vegetation was created on day three, the sun on day four. If it wasn't a literal day, you know, I know, through the process of photosynthesis, that plants wouldn't have been able to survive for any length of time without the sun. Wow. Day three, vegetation. Day four, the sun. Why did God do it in that order? Just so people would know it was a literal day. And to know that any other thought process, well, would be an impossibility. And so we have the proof that God actually created the world in six literal days as the Bible declares. The vegetation on day three, the sea 
The sun, moon, and stars, day four. Then, day five, continuing on in verse 20, God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. There it is again, talking about the process of evolution, each producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fifth day. Day five, God created birds and every living thing in the sea. God created, and what God created, God in a scientific law would produce the same kind. Showing that evolution is actually in the direct contradiction to the Bible. And by the way, if evolution was real, wouldn't you see any one living thing in the process of evolution? Now, I know some of you wives are wanting to raise your hand and say, you haven't met my husband yet. He's the missing link. But no, no, he's not. You know, you, there would be through the process if the world was truly millions of years old which they're constantly making older and older and older, what science comes up to the evidence where that couldn't have taken place in that way. Well, let's just tack another 35 million years on it and then we don't know what happened again. But God says, no, everything that I've created will produce its same kind. And God created every living thing. And it says, these sea creatures, think about the sea creatures that God has created. Even the blue whale, the blue whale can weigh up to 400,000 pounds. Just the tongue of the blue whale weighs 6,000 pounds. The tongue of a blue whale weighs the weight of three Honda Civics. It's amazing. Imagine if that blue whale got saved and became a Pentecostal. With a tongue like that, tidal waves would be taking place. God made every living creature. Day five, God created birds and sea creatures. Then day six, verse 24. God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind. Livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Day six, God said, let us make not only the animals on the ground, but then when it comes to God's greatest creation, mankind, God said, let us make mankind in our own image. Another reference to the trinity of God. The first hint and the first mention again of the triune nature of God, three in one. And God made us in his image. Jesus, the body, the physical incarnation of God. You have the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God. And you have the, the soul, that is the very essence, that's our mind, will, and emotions. That's the very essence of who we are, the very essence, the Father of God. You see that we are made in a triune nature, body, soul, and spirit, just as God himself is in a triune nature. We're made in the image of God. And that's why that God making us in his own image making us with a purpose and a plan for our lives. Satan wants nothing more than to distract you and to keep you from the very purpose in which you were created for. Because the, the Bible will talk all about how God has a plan and a purpose for your life, but the world will tell you the opposite. Evolution propagates that you happen by chance, by accident, by fortuitous events of circumstantial cladochismic events that took place that started with the goo, then moved to the zoo, 
And then finally to you. And then when you realize that we're all just animals, it should be no surprise to us as you look around our country and around the world while you see people, humans, treating each other, the very essence of what was created in God's image like animals. With the murders and the things that are taking place across our country and around the world, the, the horrible atrocities that take place within human, tra human trafficking, treating people like animals. And you, we think now as we look at society, how did we get here? It's because over the last 50 years, we've taken prayer out of schools and replaced God with these secular ideologies wanting nothing to do with God, moving God away from all of these things, saying, God, we want you out of the schools. We want you out of the courtrooms. I don't know if you saw, but in our country, they removed the Ten Commandments out of the courtroom. The Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not kill? Oh, we can't have that in our courtrooms. And you realize that the law of God, the standard of God, being removed out of society, the presence of God saying, God, we don't want you here in our country anymore. And people look at our country and think, I thought this was a Christian country. But for the last so many decades, all we've done is try to remove God out of our country and we wonder why we're in the mess and problems that we are in. We need to look at each other as people who have been created by God with a purpose and a plan in the image of God. And then it goes on to say, continuing on in verse 26, about humanity, they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on earth, and all the hunters say amen. And the small animals that scurry along the ground, all the Californians pretending to be hunters say amen. Shot a squirrel, good for you. Verse 27, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, hmm, he created them. Interesting, God made them. And when God made humanity, he made male and he made female. Now, I was so tempted just to camp here for like the next, I could teach a whole sermon on this. Because there is a satanic, and let me just say that again, it is satanic, a satanic attack against the intention of God's creation. You have to realize whatever God has created, God said it is good. And when God says something is good, something is right, you can take it to the bank. That way is going to be the best way. It is good and it is right. But whatever God has created, you have to understand, Satan wants to undermine. Satan's greatest tactic is to rob, steal, and destroy. That's the essence of Satan's character. To rob, steal, and destroy. Rob, steal, and destroy what? What God has created. What God has created you to do in your life with your purpose and your plan. We talked about that last week. How God has a plan for your life. He's created you with a specific purpose that only you were created for. And Satan wants to keep you from that purpose because if Satan can keep you from the purpose in which you exist, well then your life really is a wasted life. But a life that's surrendered and following God will never be a wasted life because as you follow God, God will accomplish his purpose in and through your life. Now, Satan wants to undermine, to rob, steal, and destroy anything that God has designed, anything that God has created, especially when it comes to the topic of God creating mankind in his own image, but then making them male and female. That's why society today propagates that there is a limitless amount of sexes. That's why the universities and the colleges around the country are saying all sorts of bizarreties. Why? Because the more confusion that we can paint about the clarity that God pictures in his word, the less likely people will be able to find God. Let me tell you it to you this way. When God created mankind, male and female, there is a picture there 
ultimately fulfilled in the picture that God has given in marriage that we'll see in a few chapters. And the reason why God created marriage between a man and a woman, <clears throat> again, if you have a problem with this, it's just in the Bible. Don't be mad at me. But God created that picture, man and woman, in a marriage because the picture of marriage is not only an illustration to you as a believer, the relationship that God desires to have with you. When the Bible talks about God wanting to have an abiding, intimate relationship where you become God living within you and being one with you. And we wouldn't be able to understand that on a human side of a level apart from the gift of marriage. But it's more than just a picture to you of the relationship that God desires to have with you. It's a picture to the unbelieving world of the relationship that God wants to have with them. And here's why. Jesus takes on the title, the groom. We as the church take on the picture of the bride of Christ. Jesus, the groom, giving his life to redeem the bride back unto himself. If you start to taint the picture of humanity between a man and a and woman, marriage between man and a woman, it begins to blur and taint the picture that God has created so that an unbelieving world would see him in marriage and understand in a greater way the relationship God wants to have with them. And that's why there is a satanic attack about redefining marriage that it doesn't have to be between a man and a woman, that there's a satanic attack about God's creation being between only male and female and not a million other things, because God says it's best for it to be that way. And whatever God says is best, Satan wants to say, no, it's not, and to create all sorts of confusion about it to undermine the plan that God has. But on day six, God created land animals and people in his own image, making them both male and female. Then verse seven or verse one of chapter two, day seven. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. So he rested from all his work and God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. God just finished creating humanity. And in verse 28, we see what God did after he created humanity. It says, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the, all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. So the conclusion of the sixth day, God goes into the seventh day. All of creation is created. Wait, I thought you said God created the, the world in seven days. Well, on the seventh day, God gives a very important picture to us. Because on the seventh day, it says he rested. God rested? Not because God was tired, man. Wow, working hard. Creating the world, man, that was tough stuff for God. No, nothing is hard for him. But God rested because it would be the conclusion of the picture of God's illustration in creation for God's plan of redemption. Now, I want to close with this. Don't, lose, don't let me lose you here because in the story of creation, we see even an illustration, a powerful illustration of the process of redemption. What do I mean by that? Well, day one. Day one in your life? Well, day one was your birthday. Welcome to planet Earth. It's the day that you came to be, day one. And like the world, you were made by the hand of God. But then because of sin and Satan, 
Well, we were empty and void, and we were living in darkness like the world was on day one. But it says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. In the Bible, water is a type, a picture of the Word of God. And it says the Spirit moved across the face of the water. The Spirit of God moves across the Word of God. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says that it's impossible for us to understand anything from God's Word apart from the Spirit of God. He is the one that gives us understanding of God's Word. Everything is revealed by the Spirit of God. And then suddenly, what takes place? The Spirit of God moves across the Word of God. And then, well, the light comes on. Ding! In our brains. We realize something. The light comes on. You come out of darkness and into light. And then God separates you in the light from darkness. He calls you out of living in darkness to live in the light. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 says, And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Sanctified literally means, can be defined, to be set apart. You were set apart from the world to live a different life when you came out of darkness into a relationship with God. Day one, God does that miraculous work. Then day two, there was space between the waters. The world was born in a water canopy, just as in the day that you and I were born, in an amniotic sac. And you became a new creation when you were birthed into this world, and so too when you came to Jesus, we use the term to be born again. Now it's amazing how many people don't know what it means to be born again. And that simply means that when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you accepted him as your Lord and Savior, that you entered into a new life. Jesus, talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, says that if, if you want to be saved, to go to heaven, that you must be born again. And, and he thought, well, how can I enter into my mother's womb a second time? And, and Jesus said, no, I'm not talking about a physical birth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. It's the day that you came to life in Jesus Christ, a new beginning in him. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Then day three, plants were created that would bear much fruit. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 8, When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. When you are in the light, you will bear much fruit. That is to say, there will be great things produced from you that people can pick from you and glean from you because of what God is producing within you then begins to have the attributes of God living within you on the outside. A lot of people think, I can just give my life to Jesus, but I don't have to change the way that I live. That's actually not biblically true. Because the true evidence of someone being born again is a transformed life. You cannot have an encounter with the resurrected Savior and remain unchanged. If you truly come to know Jesus Christ, he will then change your life, transform your life, and who he will make you into is who he created you to be. And you are meant to be a seed-bearing Christian, planting seeds, allowing people to glean from you, giving invitations to people to come to church or to come to know Jesus. Are you taking the seeds that transformed your life? and using those to transform others' lives? Because in verse 12, it says, their seeds produce plants and trees of the same kind. You are meant to reproduce more followers of Christ if you are a follower of Christ. Then day four, God made two great lights. Just as the sun is the greater light in our solar system, so too the sun, S-O-N, the sun, Jesus Christ, is the greater light and the main source of his light 
to a world living in dark, dark days. It's what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Jesus, the sun, the main source of light to the world. But so too, you are called to be the light to the world. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, that you are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. The sun, Jesus, is the greater light. So what are we? Well, we're the lesser light. But like the sun and the moon in creation, the moon is simply a reflector of the greater light, the sun shining off the moon, giving light in dark times. And so too, you and I, it's true. We're living in dark days. But in the dark days in which we live, we have an opportunity for the light of Jesus to shine through us and in us in a greater way. I remember when I was young, my family was having a garage sale. Whenever my family would have a garage sale, I would go find all the toys that my parents just bought me and try to sell them for pennies on the dollar. Wasn't a good business plan. However, I remember grabbing this old red Fisher Price flashlight with the white button to turn it on. And I took it out to outside on a sunny summer day to try to sell this flashlight. Tons of people picked it up turned it on, but then looking at the light, it didn't seem like anything was shining out of it. I remember thinking maybe it needs new batteries and I took it into the house in a dark room and I turned it on and it shined so bright. I'm like, I don't know what these people's problems are. And then I realized something even at a young age that in the darkness, the light looks a lot brighter. And we often think, man, we're living in dark days. This is horrible, and it is, but it also gives us an opportunity because we're living in some of the greatest days that mankind has ever seen. Although they are dark days, it's the greatest opportunity that we have ever had as humanity for the light of Jesus to shine out and through of our lives in a greater way, that we can truly be the light of Jesus that the light of God, the sun, would be reflecting off of us as the moon, that we would be a reflection of who he is, a reflection of his character, and a reflection of his person. But do you realize the only time that the moon is not reflecting the sun? It's when the world gets right in between the sun and the moon. And the only time in our lives that we won't be reflecting the light of Jesus in the way that we should is when we allow the world to come in between us and God. When we allow the love of the world, the cares of this world, it will stop the light from reflecting through our lives because of the world in between us and God. We need to make sure that we're being a light to the world. And don't allow your light to be eclipsed by allowing the world to come in between you and God. Then day five, God created every living creature and gave the command to be fruitful and multiply. And in your spiritual life, if you have been saved, God has saved you, not just so that you would be saved, but that you would be fruitful and multiply. God gives us that instruction as multiplying to go into the world and to preach the gospel, the great commission found in the gospel of Matthew. To go into all of creation to go to every person and to give them Jesus. And then day six, God gives you a stewardship role like he gave to humanity to oversee all that he has made. Whether that's your family, the ministry, whatever he's called you to, that you would steward well what God has made. And then day seven, he rested. And again, that rest wasn't out of exhaustion, but it was given to us as an illustration of two things, practically, to show us the importance of taking one day out of the week to set aside that would be sanctified. There is a research, research journal that was recently published showing that the majority of Christians in America no longer go to church on a weekly basis. But over the last 25 years, there's been a shift 
and going irregularly to church, but still considering themselves to be regular church attenders. What they've noticed is the word regular is actually a moving target. And now someone saying, I go to church regularly, could even mean once a month. But the first day of the week, we are to have a day in our week to set aside, to put God first, to rest in his presence. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, they set aside the first day of the week, which Sunday is, And they tell us in 1 Corinthians 11 to gather our gifts and to bring our gifts to God. Not just financial gifts, but whatever gift God has given to us to come and give that to the body of Christ. You have a gift of encouragement? Come and encourage somebody. You have a passion to pray for people? Come and find somebody to pray over. But that we would gather together on this first day of the week. So it's a practical illustration. But not only practically, it also speaks redemptively that we don't have to work to save ourselves, that we can rest in his salvation. For when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, he said this phrase, tetelestai. It's a phrase that means it is finished. What is finished? The work of redemption. That when Jesus Christ died on on the cross for your sins, for my sins, when he paid the price, He gave his life for you and for me. He said, the work is done. There's nothing more that you have to do to try to save yourself. But now God simply offers a free gift to humanity with his own life and says, here, my life in place of yours so that you wouldn't have to pay the price, the punishment for the sin that you've committed in your own life. I'll take that sin on myself as Jesus bore the weight of the world's sin on the cross. He took your place, what you deserved on the cross, so that we could take his place in heaven. And now the Bible says that Jesus is resting at the right hand of the Father. Why can Jesus rest? Because the work has been done. Just like in creation on the seventh day, the work was completed. Now he's resting, so too. In the plan of redemption, God is resting. So there's nothing more that you can do. And listen, when we try to add to what God has done, saying, well, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I accept that, but then I have to do this, 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 and this. All we're doing is cheapening the work of Jesus on the cross by saying, God, that wasn't enough. Now, when you accept Jesus Christ on the cross for your sin and he becomes your personal Lord and Savior, you have a relationship with him, a love relationship, and you always get more out of love than you do the law. You get more out of, I want to. God was willing to give his life for me. I I want to go to church and learn more about him. God was willing to die a brutal death so that I could have eternal life in heaven. Man, he's worthy of my praise. I don't, I don't have to praise. I, I want to praise. I get to praise. I don't have to read my Bible every morning. You don't. You don't have to read your Bible at all. You can remain in a stupid place for the rest of your life. But if you're smart, you'll say, I want to read my Bible. I need to read my Bible because God's word was given to me to understand who he is. And in light of who he is, the life that God would call me to live. And then as we follow the Lord and grow in our relationship with the Lord, you understand there's nothing more that I can do to save myself. Every single religion has this one premise. Every religion, whether it's Catholicism, Mormonism, Islam, every religion at the very basis of all religion has this one thing the same. It's all about you working your way to God. But the Bible is different. It's not about a religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ that Jesus left his place in heaven, came to the earth. He built the bridge to you, gave his life for you, and paved the way through the wood on the cross of Christ, a bridge that would separate the gulf between the presence of God and where you're currently at through a gulf of sin that would permanently forever separate you from God but through the love of Jesus Christ, giving his life for you to redeem you. And now there's nothing more that you have to do 
just a bunch of things that you get to do as you grow in your relationship with him? Would we see creation in a new light as we realize it's a picture, an illustration of God's plan of redemption?